Hi guys, it's Mary McIntyre. Welcome to another video. This is a special one because it's my first ever YouTube collab, um, so I'm very excited. Um, Mark Radici from Refreshing Views approached me because as well as being a fellow astrophotographer, he also does astronomy sketching. And he thought it'd be a really good idea if we set ourselves a challenge to draw some objects and then get together and talk about how we approach that and just really have a chat about sketching in general. So. Um, if that sounds like something you'd like to watch, then keep watching. Um, Mark's channel will be linked below, so please make sure you go over and check out his video. We've both got the same footage, but we're going to be editing our videos separately, so it'll be worth watching both to see which bits make the final cut. I'm also going to include some really short time lapses of me creating my three sketches, and... I find that those super quick ones are fine for Instagram, but in terms of YouTube, I like the slightly longer ones. So I am going to include the longer time lapses in a separate set of videos as well on my channel. So if you prefer to watch me working in a bit of a slower pace than having three hours condensed to like 25 seconds or something, then that's something to look out for. Um, so just make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss those uploads. Enjoy the video. So good morning and welcome to Mary McIntyre's house this time <laughs> and as always she's made a cup of tea and you're, you've got a coffee. Coffee with the cats on the cup obviously. <laughs> so Mary we've done the collaboration we've done some sketches we've both done our own objects what are we but actually before we go into that let's talk so what's your background what's your background in astronomy what's your passion? Uh, if it's in the sky, I love it, basically. So I've been into astronomy since I was a young child, but when I had the opportunity 10 years ago to do the astronomy GCSE, that kind of really ignited the serious astronomer in me. And I went on and did some qualifications with the Open University, and my job now is doing astronomy talks and freelance writing. So I do stuff for You Look Up Astronomy, Sky at Night magazine, stuff like that. So, so yeah. you're a professional astronomer, technically. Um, <laughs> a keen amateur, I think I'd describe myself as. <laughs> no. So what about you? When did you get into astronomy? So it's one of those things, I can't imagine, I can't imagine there are people who are not interested in astronomy, if you know <laughs> what I mean. In the sense that, I mean, for example, last night, it was hazy, there was a bright full moon, it was then starting to fog over. And my wife and the children were inside and they, they love watching, I don't know, murder mystery, you know, um, <laughs> Midsummer Murders and Death in Paradise. And I was outside and I saw Jupiter, the great red spot, four moons. I saw Saturn and the rings, uh, the Andromeda galaxy, uh, a beautiful double star in Andromeda called Almac, and M15, the globular cluster. And it wasn't the best night, but I got my new bino view, I got for my birthday. And I just had the best night ever. And I was thinking... The, uh, why isn't everybody else yeah. outside looking up at this? You I'd know, take Saturn. that over the telly any night. <laughs> Definitely. So, yeah, a bad night in the observatory is better than a good night. Definitely. Yeah. Right, so we, we're sort of going to do a sketching session today, aren't we? So obviously it's a beautiful summer's day and we've got our sketches that we've worked on. So we picked a couple of targets, didn't we? And we've got all our kit here. So let's talk through. So what did we go for first? Which one should we do first? Which um, one have you got there? This one I've got is... M11. M11, the beautiful Messier cluster. Yeah, the That's wild sort of duck cluster, and no matter how much I look at this cluster, I cannot see a duck. So do you know why it's called the wild duck cluster? I do not know why it's called that. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> I think the problem is we, we look at photographs now, and photographs pick up way more than the eye will see. And these clusters were named visually. And visually, when you look at something close up, I think it looks very different from the photograph. As we're going to see, because we've worked differently for this collab haven't we yeah so i did mine at the eyepiece of my notebook and you did yours i did mine oh, from a photograph oh, beautiful so yeah i did it from a photograph and it was a photograph that we took ourselves in the garden so it was um, taken with the eight inch richie Cresham. And it was daunting, to be honest, because there are so many stars in a cluster that's in the Milky Way and trying to get them all in the right place is actually more challenging than doing it at the eyepiece, I think. Oh, that is wonderful, isn't it? Look at that for beautiful... See, yours looks more like a duck. You can kind of vaguely see a body and some wings, whereas mine is just stars. So I was trying to work out the orientation, isn't it? Because 
You've got the one bright star in the middle, haven't we? Ignore that, the um, the paint pen blob. Ah. So that's not a bright star. That's but I am just linking then. So I've got this little, which I use for reference. I've got two stars, two stars, and then it formed this sort of, I don't know, rhinoceros horn, which I think is one, two, three, four, yes, five. Yes, I think it's there. So yeah, so obviously where mirror, I've got a diagonal in there for the eyepiece. So that's yes. what's happening there. So why don't you hold that up to the camera and I'll hold it. And this is our very different sketches. So isn't that amazing? So you've done yours from your photograph. So yeah. how did you do that? You've obviously done it on black paper and yeah, a white pen. Right? I, Which, I adore and, working on black paper. Um, I do, if I work at the eyepiece, I very often do it on white like you have and then invert it digitally. But for this one, I just wanted to do it on black, partly because I, I first of all mark everything out with a white um, pen, pencil, the pastel pencils I really like because you can sharpen them and get a nice point. So I'm going to start taking notes of my own. <laughs> so I, my favourite brand are the Stabilo Cardabello, not sponsored, but if they ever want to reach out and give me some free ones, I'd be very happy because they're not cheap. But these just give me the best kind of payoff in terms of what shows up on the paper so I'll use this to kind of mark things out originally once I've got the basic bright stars in I go in with um, a Posca paint pen because that doesn't rub off so easily and just gently dab over that and then once I've got the bright stars in place I will go in with my pencil and do the fainter ones once I've got the entire star field in place, I then use a technique where you scrape the pastel pencil directly onto the page. Oh, it makes all shavings. Just a little tiny shavings and use a fluffy brush and just blend. Oh, just blend. Ah. And that gives you that like background nebulosity. And you can do that with a lead pencil as well if you're doing a cluster that has star glow. You can just scrape the pencil and use mm. a dry fluffy brush to just blend it. And depending on which direction you blend it in will give you a different finish. Oh, wow. So I know that visually when I've looked at this cluster it has a really kind of distinctive square shape. Right. So I've kind of used a little bit of my memory of what the mm. kind of background glow looked like in the cluster and I added that from like my mental picture of it. Gotcha. So it's a bit of an artistic interpretation <laughs> with that like finishing touch. Well, that's a beautiful sketch isn't it? <laughs> and certainly at the eyepiece you've got one really bright star in the middle and have you oh, got, that, that must be that, that must be that one i presume yeah it's kind of like a double star isn't oh, did it, it? Oh, right. it on the photograph it looked like double it could be the mount didn't try it properly <laughs> and then and then there's there's a whole load of stars that are just on that limit of resolution just coming out so it's like a granular like as someone sprinkled sugar and you can just about see the crystals well, that's another thing that i do as well after i've blended one thing when you look at a photograph in particular you quite often see what look like super faint ghost stars because they're the ones that are just at the limit of what the camera really? can detect okay. if you carefully scrape your pastel pencil then press your finger into it the stars will not be exactly in the right place but it gives that impression of the faint background stars so if you look closely at this picture I'll, i'm going to put a picture of this up on screen anyway But you can see that there are some really faint stars in the yeah. background, and I did that. Once you've pressed it once, you've got a stamp of it on your finger, and you can then so press it's like around. Stippling, isn't it? It's stippling, yeah. and, and it is artistic license because those stars are not exactly in the right place. I think if so. you were to do this, though, exactly in the right, I think you'd still be there now. Yes. Trying to do it. <laughs> There's know. a lot of stars there. You've got to do, and there's things like the double cluster. I just oh. never, I would never bother to sketch it. Yeah, I think you, I don't think it's physically it's, possible. It's daunting, isn't it? And I know even when Deep Sky Stacker, when I was stacking the photographs of this, it was detecting like over a thousand stars. Really? So My goodness. It's a lot. <laughs> so yeah, so you couldn't be doing that for... So I've got in my notes here, so I said the Milky Way was easy to see, so that's a, obviously a sign of a good clear night. It's warm, this is when we had that hot spell in early September when it was, summer was here, all the kids had gone back to school, that's the best, when it's <laughs> nice and warm. Kids, yeah, we had a rainy August and then kids went back to school and the sun came out. Um, I can't read what that says. And I had a tawny owl, there was a tawny owl going by us in the oh, video. Oh, lovely. So I could hear him, but I couldn't see him. Because um, you had the owl with you when you sketched the, night, the dumbbell, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, Did you do them on the same night? Yeah. Okay. So if I, yeah, well, that's a, that's a good segue then. So
So the yes. star cluster, I find star clusters, unless it's a bright open cluster and all the stars are easy to place, these, um, what's the other ones? That Caroline's Rose up in Cassiopeia. Yeah. 7789, if I say from memory, just a nose pop. 7789, I find really hard to sketch because you've got this, there's a star, there's just so many stars to actually position it. I think we're about to have an intruder. So you've got the dumbbell there. Now you're, you're, I'd be amazed if I could see it like that in the eyepiece. That is, yeah, I would but as a draw, well. that is absolutely <laughs> beautiful. That is very much more like a photograph, isn't it? So how did you, how did you put that together? Pretty much using the same technique. So I had a photograph that was taken, this is taken with the Forks telescope. So it's a two meter Ritchie Crescent oh, telescope, wow, that's a... which is why you can see so much color and so much detail. I put in the stars first because I've realized that if I try to freestyle the shape of the nebula first, it will end up distorted and then the stars won't fit on. So I put the bright stars on first to give me a kind of vague map so that I knew where to bring these edges. Then all of this was done by scraping the pastel. The pencils did not touch the page. Stabilo, Stabilo Carpathello, scraping it with a scalpel and then using a brush. And I've made a time lapse of me creating all of these. Which so is that a paintbrush? Is that what you're saying? When dry you dry well. paintbrush. So if you do the circular motions, it blends, like gives you just like a background transparent glow. But then for these sort of tendrils of structure, I just blend in a side to side motion or just dab so that you get more of the colour staying on the page. Oh, and then you can just go in with the white and then there was a kind of teal colour. And my husband always says teal is a duck, not a colour. Yeah, I was going to say, is... what colour is teal? Is <laughs> it's a kind of turquoisey colour. And then there was this oh, sort beautiful. of reddish pink around the outside. And I can see from your picture, you can sort of see that apple core structure. It looks yeah. more like an apple core to me than the dumbbell. Yes, so that's what I've written. So you've actually, yeah, boiled beautiful twin load apple. That's yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. So yeah, that that bit there, I think. Actually, yeah, that's, that's I think the, that's the apple core bit, and then the right. rest is the outer and that shell. bit's really faint. So that's the bit you see this sort of figure of eight in the middle, and then the fainter left and right, you can sort of see as a ghostly glow. It's a very beautiful object. I've looked at it through our ten inch Dobsonian, and it is stunning. Um, our Dobsonian isn't working properly at the moment, which is part of the reason I did these from photographs. It's very important, I know you've done a video on this, but getting your ergonomics right when you're sketching is so important, and I'm struggling with that at the moment. I need to make some adaptations for my binoculars. So you're saying, talking of binoculars, another segue off, are you making a parallelogram? A parallelogram? Thanks. Yes, I'm planning to. <laughs> I was inspired by your video, I definitely need one because it's impossible to, to work without injuring your neck without one. Definitely. So that will help. So we were saying as well, if you get a sun lounger, and relax on the sun lounger and you can look up overhead with oh, it. Oh yeah. But then suddenly you'll wake up and it's three in the morning <laughs> and it'll be really cold. I, I foresee a lot of that over the winter once I've got my parallelogram out. And, and, and you'll be snoring. Yep. My neighbours are used to me roaming the garden in the night. <laughs> so how did you approach your one? Did you, you so did this I did. So this is done at the eyepiece. So I've got the telescope in the observatory. Okay. And what I do is I roll the roof back, take all the dust covers off, dew, cover, dew shield on, that sort of thing. Uh, I line up and I, I generally 
give I'd say I don't know 15 20 minutes let my eyes adjust to the dark so I have no lights I'm making your cat fall asleep look. oh no it's woken up now <laughs> so uh, you've obviously got to have proper dark adaptation you've got to let your eyes adjust to the night so the camera especially with a big telescope can what's the app is so how long was your exposure I mean multiple minutes yeah these were three minute exposures from memory so I can't stack an image on my eye for, no. for three minutes but you can see the ghostly glow and that's what I love about sort of visual astronomy is I've, I've seen it myself as you've seen it with your telescope and there is a colour to it isn't there you can see a colour with this object if so, you let your eyes adapt yeah. so I've definitely seen the blue certainly not so much the pink, uh, but interesting yeah with the Dobsonian so, I've definitely seen that and, and it's quite cool because you think this is a this is a star that's not much bigger than our sun that's got to the end of its life and it's puffed out this atmospheric um, it, it's stellar atmosphere and I think you see that there right in the middle of yours is that white dwarf and that's the core of the original Sun and that's just left behind it's left behind these lovely shells of gas and you think that's amazing you, you're actually seeing a dying star yeah. with your own eyes you know and there it is it's above your heads and this was the first because it's so bright this was the first planetary nebula discovered but they're nothing to do with planets are they no they just it's look, a misleading name yeah in fact, it's more of a visual thing when they were surveying telescopes that, that central star is very handy when you're sketching that, because it the, gives you a starting point doesn't it gives you somewhere to go out from so i wait for my eyes to get used to the dark and so 20 minutes half an hour whatever or so and i'll start then with a propelling pencil so it's always nice and sharp the mechanical pencil and then i'll start putting in the brighter stars so i've got one two three four and i and i'm mentally in my head think well that star's off at about whatever that is sort of 10 o'clock and slightly below that one and sort of half that distance is that star and then this one's over here you know slightly further out and we've got this one the same height over there now straight up from there in the middle and you start by grids and angles and just above just below you you start putting this star pattern together and like you once you've got the framework and i think well it's just between these two faint ones but a bit below and a little bit across to there and above there and you start smudging them in and my lifesaver sorting out this. so i've nicked one of my kids stationary sets <laughs> and i get this so i have an hp pencil just an ordinary hp pencil and a blending stump yep. so if i use a piece of scrap paper and i put a bit of pencil on the side and then you can pick up and start and do a really subtle building yeah so you're not marking it directly with pencil but you're sort of smudging it into place and you can sort of start picking this up and you think well this one's a bit brighter than the other so i'll add a bit more in there to sort of build it up it's beautiful and then you can sort of smudge it out with your fingers and blend it in and build up the background and then scratch your face so you yeah got that, that nose. <laughs> you see you can use cotton buds a little bit for this and when i do sketching workshops with people i usually take packs of cotton buds and because I never throw the old ones away now because you can always use them depending on uh, what colours on the end you can do that subtle glow with it if you don't want to do the paintbrush technique and that is one of the best pieces of advice I can give anybody that is sketching your pencil doesn't have to draw it you can scribble and like you say pick it up with a cotton bud or a blending stump and that will give you the, the not a harsh line it's such a subtle glow and it's a really good technique yeah and then as you say you get graphite all over you as yeah. you smudge it <laughs> and then you'll put your forearm in the original graphite part and then smudge it over as well always so, that's yeah. why it's great doing it in pencil because you can rub it out so talking of that then we both got one of these haven't we so i bought one of these one of these sort of eraser shields and i find that really useful with an eraser pencil if i didn't decide i want to rub a specific thing in me wob out you can and you got the same yeah. thing um yes they only came the other day and they're very very flimsy they're just from a random ebay seller so just a thin so aluminium, it was, aluminium thanks to your video i knew what they were called i wanted <laughs> one for so long and didn't know what they were called so looking forward to playing with those because I, I do a lot of sketching at the eyepiece i just didn't do it for this and i think it's really interesting to look at the difference between the eyepiece sketches versus the sketch from photograph and mm. i think they're both valid yours are proper observations mine are kind of more rt but the techniques are still the same and you can practice from photographs and then do it at the eyepiece and it will yeah work. so that's a good idea isn't it because when we've got cloudy nights night after night after night like we tend to have in in the uk 
you can then still practice your techniques and build the nuts. So when you do have a good clear night, there's no moon, there's no cloud, there's no fog, there's no dew. And that happens you... a lot in the UK, <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> That's three nights of the year. You're then, at least your sort of brain motor skills are, are switched on. Photograph, but I tried to do this at the eyepiece and boy was it a hard topic. You did better than me, I, w I wished out. <laughs> I don't blame you because we were going to do the <gasps> North America Nebula Look at that. and I did this from somebody else's narrowband image. This is such a huge nebula and it's really, really faint and even trying to get any of it in the eyepiece and actually be visible was so difficult. Uh -huh. So I wussed we out and decided, on come on, get down you. <laughs> um, so I did this using that technique of the brush, just blending the pastel pencils with the brush did the stars first, but did it from a narrowband image, which is picking up structures that you can't see visually. So the, I, I'm not normally a fan of the Hubble palette, but this picture, the photograph I did this from is one of my favorite that I've ever seen of this object. Wow. So I decided to do it. And I, I really, it's one of my favorite sketches that I've ever done, actually. That's I'm beautiful, really isn't it? I'm really pleased with it. So, so um, I, when I've looked <laughs> at this, and so if you hold that round the other way to the camera, so is that bit down there, I'm trying to see where the pencil is so I don't touch it. So that bit down there is Central America and Mexico, isn't it? You got this bit is the is it Gulf of Florida or whatever it's called. I am hopeless at geography, so I don't actually know. <laughs> so I think from memory. Um, so this is the Cygnus wall here. That's the is Cygnus that wall, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So this bit down here is the Cygnus wall. So I had to when I was in Florida at the Winter Star Party, I did have to sell the people calling it the North American Oh, nebula yes, that's and you say no 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 it doesn't belong to north america it looks like <laughs> so it's the north america nebula yes yeah. so yeah so that's the bit i could see visually but it is really low surface brightness and it's huge it fills fills the eyepiece this is almost a binocular yeah. you need a small telescope angle. or binocular with a big field of view and it needs to be very very dark and i suspect one of those filters that helps nebulae pop mm. would be good so i do want to do this at the eyepiece i'm not going to be beat by it but i just couldn't do it this time <laughs> i need to um yeah needed to change up how i was going to do it but I, I really do very 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 happy with this and the background regions here i did that thing again where you scrape the pencil and okay. stamp it in with your finger to give those clusters of background stars which is artistic license because that's not the exact position of all of them but but I would such be a here rich for 10 years, years. <laughs> there's no way you could get them all on. I think you're absolutely right, isn't it? Because you'd be, it's such a rich part of the Milky Way. picture these sort of dark dust lanes because this area is full of dust isn't it the bright dust that's glowing to make the nebula and then dark dust that, that's obscuring and, and blocking the view isn't it when i first started to use this technique i put too much pastel on the page and lost that so i had to then go in with black pastels to to pull that back but i've now learned less is more do the minimal amount of pastel blend it in and then you can always add more you can't take it away yeah, so nice. i've kind of learned having done a few of these when I, if you saw my video of me when i sketched the western veil i did a tutorial on that technique and i put way too much pastel down <laughs> so the first layer was just way too much color so it, it's just been trial and error learning what not to do and it's fine to do it wrong. You don't learn if you don't make mistakes. That's true, isn't it? There are Very many true. sketches I've done that I thought, oh, that wasn't so good. <laughs> but it's interesting, then you can see your improvements over time, can't you? So yeah. if you keep those, so never ever throw an observation away. You can just keep never. them coming. There's value in every single sketch that you've done. And even if the sketch itself doesn't look perfect, you've learned the skills of observing in a way that will allow you to sketch. And that that's important. 
because it'll make you a better observer even if you're oh, not sketching. Oh, she comes again. Come on, you get that's down. A little cameo <laughs> appearance there. So that's very true because when you look at, I mean, not that we're in um, any way I'm going to link myself to these sort of artists, but when you look at Michelangelo's notebooks or um, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, before they actually produce their masterpiece, their notebooks are full of practice sketches, aren't they? And they've got 30 or 40, you know, of what's the man in the circle and the square. Oh, yeah. And if you look through his old notebooks when I was studying this at school, you know, he's got 30 or 40 practice sketches Gosh. to get the form right. And then it's then, right now, I've ironed out all the bugs, the brain, the hand, pencil system is now working. And then you produce <laughs> the final one. And it's by doing those practices and learning how the light and the shadows and all that all fits together. It, it, it really does help you as an observer afterwards. Even if you've only tried to sketch something a couple of times, it will improve you're observing because it's so easy to think oh yeah that's the dumbbell and now I'm going to go over here and then I'm going to look there and you haven't looked at it and if you take a photograph of it you'll process the picture and look at the photograph and think oh yeah it's a nice photo but you won't have studied where the nebulosity is that's and the structure point. of it and I think since I first started sketching I started sketching because I'd become obsessed with photography and I hadn't oh, really? looked in an eyepiece for a year and I was like oh my god this is this is not what astronomy is about, we're supposed to be observing. So my first sketches of Jupiter, and they're not even round, they're just the crudest sketches, but I'm, I love them because that was where I started and it turned me into a better observational astronomer. Brilliant, so. brilliant. So I can remember talking to a chap called Owen Brazel, don't they? Oh, know yes. Him? So Owen sometimes comes down to us when we observe on Salisbury Plain, get away from all the dark skies. And he said to me, he so said, just, Instead of taking five minutes, ten minutes, whatever, he said, just take half an hour, an hour one night to just, just look. And I was looking at M33 and I had my little eight and a half inch, my first sort of big telescope. And I was sketching away. And I said, I thought, that's odd. There's this sort of bright, you could just about make out the spiral arms. And I said, that's odd. There's this bright, sort of looks like a globular cluster in the field of view. And it was a star cloud, one of these dense star clouds, but it was actually in the galaxy, how many oh, million light wow. years away. <laughs> and I hadn't noticed it until I got the pencil and paper and started doing the sketch, because it was only a little bit bigger than the star, but it was slightly granular. You wouldn't have noticed it on a photograph probably either. Yeah. But now, whenever I go out, I always look for it and I go, oh, there it is, because <laughs> I stumbled across it. I was 200 years late to claim the discovery, but it was my own. <laughs> independent discovery. But I think, like you said, the important thing as well is to be fully dark adaptive. If you look at the same object for 20 minutes, you start to see things there that you didn't see at the beginning That's as true, well. The, the, your, your eyes settle into it, you get used to the averted vision things and things will just pop and it's so easy to be tempted to just like do a Messier marathon and not look properly. Hmm. <clears throat> just tick them off, train spotting, tick, yeah. tick, tick, stamp collecting. And you won't remember those, I bet you couldn't draw them from memory or mm. even guess at the structure of everything if you've gone that fast through the objects. It's a bit like when you go to an art gallery, isn't it? And if yeah. you rush around and see 100 pictures in a day, you'll forget them. But if you study three or four, take your time, then you'll yeah. get much more out of study it. Study the brush strokes. And, and I think it's really fun as well to sketch the same objects more than once. I, I love to do them on black paper, but I also love drawing on white paper. So sometimes I'll do the same object from an eyepiece sketch and a photograph and sometimes on white paper sometimes on black and you're using different techniques and you'll pick up different things doing that and, and it's an excuse to just keep drawing stuff it is isn't it and what's quite that's a good point about memory because i flip back through my notebook and i and i remember things that i would otherwise forget so you know going out and observing you know what's this sort of virgo galaxies and but this is when we were in lockdown earlier this year and so instead of meeting up to observe, of course, and be outside with other people, we weren't allowed to do that. So we used to set up a Zoom and I used to have that on. I'd turn the screen off, but leave the microphone and we would be chatting. Oh, There's different nice. people in different telescopes in the astronomy club, different observatories. And one chap's measuring exoplanets and someone's looking at the planets and I was visually observing these galaxies. But, you know, we were chattering away and I'd forget that if I didn't write it down because all oh, they'd all merge into one. So M51. I love your observations of like the owls and stuff like that as well because there have been many times I've been out and a hedgehog's been snuffling oh, on really? my feet and you know I and you'll hear a fox that you know can be quite daunting if you're in a field by yourself and you hear a fox you're kind of like oh it sounds a bit scary. So how do you manage your dark adaptation and you said that was important at the eyepiece how do you make sure your eyes are you're getting all that light through to your eyes? Keep your phone off 
even when it's at minimum brightness your phone is going to trash your dark adaptation when i'm sketching i use a clip-on led light and i took one for the team and ate a load of quality street yeah. orange creams <laughs> and strawberry creams and just wrapped that around oh, to just okay. right. this has two settings quality streets is going on my yep, shopping list <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking about Dark adaptation, weren't we? And you yes. had your light before my card then filled up. So you <laughs> ate all your quality streets, I which is good to keep street, yeah. hydrated with a <laughs> cup of tea. Because the thing is, like, your light is, is red, but the LEDs oh, are too bright, and even a red LED light will wreck your night vision. So wrapping anything around it to just make that more diffused is a really good idea. So and quality streets? So I, yeah, so I <laughs> used a um, milk bottle. Not as much Plus fun as quality street, but no. it works really well. <laughs> But what I, th I think I might, having just spoken to you while, we, while we're sorting the cameras out, I think I'm going to get a few more layers and just help diffuse that. But I do have this Skywatcher. I've had this for years. It's one of these things that seems to punch so well above its weight. You know, it's whatever, a 10 or 15 quid. But because it's dimmable, you can rotate. That's so good. Then you can make it bright and dim. Because the LED red head torches are so incredibly bright that you're blind if you put them on. I yeah. mean, they're just... Well, I think much. they're designed for people who are actually, you know, mountain biking or walking at night and stuff, yeah, aren't they? But they're sold in astronomy wholesalers yeah. and they're too bright. So it doesn't matter what you use. Now, I jokingly say that you've got to eat quality street, but it can be anything that's going to just mute that down. And because you can clip it, you can angle this to not shine at your face but illuminate your page and you can make it so that it's illuminating just the bit that you're working on because if you keep it closer to the page you don't get as much kind of back glare either so i usually have a clipboard with that on oh. and i don't have a fancy thing like you do so i tie my pencils on a bit of string and tie them to the clipboard so if i drop them they don't go on do you the have floor. your gloves on a piece of string through your sleeves uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> So, this is, so Mary was just mentioning there, so what I've, I've not used to, for years, I've literally just written in a notebook, you know, just hold a notebook and hold the torch in one hand, or I'm flashlights, if you're from America. Make a telescope move along. And, and yes, yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so if you're nudging as well, so I end up... You need to be an octopus. <laughs> and you end up running out of hands. So I think the idea of having a clip, something that you clip on then, is really useful, isn't it? Because Definitely. it does... Does, does free up one hand. And the other thing I've got, and I, I didn't think about getting this until literally about two or three days ago. And this is an old um, pilot's knee board. So when you're flying, you would strap this on onto, the, onto your thigh. So when you get a different radio frequency or the weather, you can, you can scribble it down and you can do your navigation calculations. But it's really useful because of course you've got a, your, clip. your clipboard. And then I bought a couple of these, what do you call these metal things there for um, nurses. Yeah, an oh, engineer, okay. so when you've got to hold, you know, pens in, in your lapel and stuff. But then I can then hold. They're so good, I'm going to order some of those. So I'm going to make you spend a fortune. We've yeah. done this one video and you, <laughs> you've spent at least eight pounds now since we've spoken. So there you are, and then you can hold everything. It's so good. In the right place. That's better than a bit of string, definitely. And then what happens, of course, it's dark and you've got your dim red light and you can't see it. You spend all your time, which pocket or which shelf have I put them on? Well, I like your eraser as well. I haven't seen one of those. I need to buy one of those as well. So I normally cut the end off mine with a, a craft knife. Then I've got a nice sharp point. But you can't keep that on your clipboard. So it's uh, in my pocket or I drop it on the floor and then it's wet. And then, yeah, so, so yeah, that's, so that's really just a, a pencil. It's like a propelling pencil. But, but for an eraser. That's so good. There's stuff that you didn't even know existed. It's amazing. And then with that, that um, eraser shield, and then what's the other one? So I always try and go for propelling pencils, that, or ordinary pencils, that have a, an eraser, a rubber at the end. The Americans will laugh at us if we say rubber, so yeah. we'll have to say eraser. So <laughs> pencil have, eraser. Yeah, so we have a pencil eraser at the end. So you don't then have to faff around, oh, I put that in the wrong place. I can just spin it around and yeah. do that. So. That's the other and thing. And choose one that actually has a nice soft eraser on the end because some of the cheap pencils you buy, they're just like rigid and they don't rub out properly. I've got loads in the cupboard that are terrible. The erasers just don't work. Uh, so when you're buying them, I think it's good to just feel how soft the, the eraser yeah, okay. is because the rigid ones just make a mess. I hadn't thought of that. I, I, just, I thought an eraser was an eraser. No, some of them are really horrible. I, I guess they've been in the shop for 20 years and they've just gone too hard or something, uh, I don't know. But I've got plenty that don't work. <laughs> so do you just use ordinary 
mechanical pencils you know do, or do you use different types do, of pencils um, i use different weights of pencils so i have this set which is going to last me my entire life um <laughs> i tend to use the 2b most commonly especially for luna because i love when i'm sketching the moon to get the harsh shadows that's one of the things that i really love about luna sketching trying to do that with an hb pencil means you're kind of scribbling away so i use the 2b and if necessary i might use a 4b pencil um because it's the dark really shadows. soft but it's quite dark it blends a lot the trouble is if you then put your hand in it and you put hand prints all over your page so i kind of do that as a last step and I also use a tissue to cover part of the page if I'm uh, going back idea. and forth. I've learned the hard way that you get pastel pencil or lead all over everything, including your face. So yeah, I'll use a mixture usually of HB, 2B and 4B. Um, I've very occasionally gone darker, but it's a bit too blendable. It smudges everywhere uh, okay. and makes a bit of a mess. The, the H pencils are good for doing a sharp line if it's necessary because they don't blend out very well because they're that much harder so you can see i've hardly used those whereas the bees have been sharpened down by about a third now oh i see but i've had these pencils for so long and there's still hardly any of them gone um i'm not particularly fussed about the brand of pencil that i use as long as it's a graphite one i'm happy i'm fussy about my pastels but with these if all you have at home is an hb pencil you can make it work you don't have to buy anything fancy yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. And as usual, you know, so we've got, I've got two young girls, so I'm always nicking their art collection. But you've yeah. actually got to go and buy your own, haven't you? I have such a huge art collection already, yeah. but um, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm good. So how do you choose objects that you're interested? In? That's another question I had for you. So what do you just find something that catches your eye, something that you notice in the sky? What what makes you choose? I'm going to sketch this object over the thousand other objects that you could choose um, if it's the moon it will be i'll see a photograph that will have a really nice mountain shadow or a crater wall shadow and i'll instantly be drawn to that and just really i love the harsh boundary on the moon because it doesn't have an atmosphere the shadows are really dark the highlights are really white and that really excites me when i'm doing luna so i'll look at very dramatic landscape it, it is it? it's just so so beautiful and you get loads of pareidolia when you sketch it as well and i did a sketch of a crater recently and someone could see eight different faces in it and i hadn't noticed it it's, what it's was amazing. That really? Par pareidolia it's where the human brain sees um, patterns that aren't really there yeah. and generally assigns a human characteristic to oh, it okay. so somebody was like oh yeah i can see um, a man with a checkered cravat i was like it's a lunar crater and then i was like oh yeah i see what you mean now because I, yeah. I break it down in an abstract way i don't look at the whole picture until i've finished i break it down and do the white bit there and then that shadow there and so i'll, I'll just see a lunar picture and it will make me go i want to draw that with nebulae um I like to try to draw at the eyepiece the stuff that's brighter and some of my favourite clusters. Mm. I love star clusters because although it can be daunting, I find them a bit easier to do than nebulae at the eyepiece. Oh, okay. So I love sketching the sun as well. We've got a hydrogen alpha telescope. Oh. So using my coloured pastel pencils to do prominences. Oh, your oh yeah, we'll, we'll leave okay. that, yeah. Um, so yeah, use prominences and sunspots. I, I do those at the eyepiece as well. So if there's something interesting on the sun, I'll go for That's that. That's amazing because the sun can change in five minutes, can't yeah. it? As these solar With flares build up. Alpha in yeah. them, it's amazing. So I really, really love solar sketching. Too. And you're watching that real time, aren't you? You're not watching it on the laptop or the monitor. You're actually yeah, seeing it. Yeah, you're actually seeing it in real time, and that's good. I do from photographs as well, but the sun I can sketch really quickly at the eyepiece. So yeah. I've got a well, you have to, don't you? If you're, if you're solar yeah. sketching, yes, it hard now for definitely. So yeah, it's usually if it's doing things from a photograph, there'll just be something about the photograph, whether it's the colour scheme or the shapes that will just catch my eye, or favourite objects that I've imaged previously and I just want an artistic version of it. Like I've done the Crab Nebula, there's an acrylic painting on the wall up there of the Crab oh, Nebula. We'll show you that afterwards, put it on the list. <laughs> um, so yeah, I really enjoy doing that, but I've also done a pastel sketch of it as well, which is really different from the acrylic. And I love doing nebulae inspired art with fluid acrylics as well. So I, I, I just love anything art that is related to astronomy in space. So I do artistic stuff that isn't a, like an accurate representation of an object as well. So 
that makes you more creative. I just think. to it's good. Yeah, understand the beauty and the magnificence yeah. of the object you're looking at. That's really interesting. So yeah, it's uh, I just I love it. I love art. I love astronomy. Being able to put the two together is epic. Perfect, <laughs> isn't it? Perfect. So I've been doing the. Have, so you got the Messier list. The Messier yes, catalog. I need to work my way through that. Yep, and then the next observing challenge I'll give you then is the Herschel 400. So, <laughs> so, so William Herschel was out in the out in the day, you know, scanning all these objects. And I think William Herschel himself, as well as discovering Uranus and moons of Saturn, he discovered two and a half thousand deep sky objects. And Caroline did as well. Didn't Carol, she yeah, she discovered she and did. she discovered a whole load of comets, didn't she? Yeah. So obviously they were paid to be astronomers, so they had the time. So even from when people say astronomy in the UK is rubbish, you know, William Herschel can discover two and a half thousand objects, and it can't all be bad. But they've got an observing list of 400 sort of best and brightest, and I say that's a relative term because these are not the best and brightest objects in the sky. But there's 400 uh, wow. objects, <laughs> and it just takes. I've been working on it for years, and there's stuff, of course, that's quite low down, so I find that quite it's hard quite a to challenge, see. challenge, isn't it? And the scene's terrible when you've got something low down, yeah. and if it's in a part of your sky that's really bad for light pollution as well, it's pretty bad. But you do get, and I'm going to flip back again, seren serendipitous discoveries there it is so this is one of my i didn't even know this existed the other day this is ngc 5353 which is actually a one of these sort of um galaxy clusters what do you call that um hickson 68 there it is okay hickson 68 we have one two three four galaxies all wow. together in the same field of view and i didn't know it and, I, and it's just ngc 5353 that's in the eye on the on the list and you swing the telescope over and you think Hang on a second. There's there's other galaxies. Uh, hold on. There's another one. Another one. And then it's when you're sketching, you think, oh my goodness. So you think, how many stars are in each galaxy? How many billion stars? And how many planets are around each star? It's mind blowing. And it, and it's these serendipitous discoveries. And I say, if you don't write them down, if you don't sketch them, if you just tick it and move on, you'll, yeah. you'll sort of forget what and they look like. It, it, it's just incredible when you look at these galaxy clusters. I mean, even the Andromeda galaxy is fairly big and bright, but it's 2.5 million light years away. And that light has traveled so far for us to capture it and put it on paper. That's before humans existed, it's, before home. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. So it gets tough. Blows my mind. And if it doesn't blow your mind, you haven't understood it. Yes. <laughs> So what next, so Mary? So what's your next observing or sketching or art um, project? I actually really want to get my ergonomics right first. I need to get the parallelogram mount and I, I need to do ju just try and figure out a way of making my sketching set up a little more ergonomic because I'm struggling with that at the moment. Once I've done that, I've got Steve Tonkin's binocular astronomy book and I'm oh, going to work my way through and see what I can see with my binoculars and hopefully capture a lot of that on paper as well. Well, that guy doesn't know about binoculars. I know. <laughs> and the binoculars I have, my big ones, are ones that he built from other pairs. They're the Franken oh, binoculars. Oh, the Franken binoculars. Yeah. Yes, I saw that. They're yeah. amazing. I won them in a raffle and it's just like the best. I hardly ever win raffles, but I'm glad that I won that one. So, they're phenomenal. so I can recommend to you then on your Christmas list is one of those Bino Bandits, one of those foam. I've got one. Have you got yes, one? Brilliant. They're fantastic. Honestly, they are game changing. Yeah, I th I, it's one of those things. I thought, how did I not? <laughs> and they make one for a single eyepiece as well, a spot bandit. They call oh, that do one. They? Okay, because yeah, I used to just kind of do that thing where you cup your hands here, so you... and so you're blocking that way. But they're heavy binoculars, so it's hard to do that. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Well, Mary, thank you so much for your time. It's been a real pleasure to, one, drink your tea and eat your cakes and meet your cat, <laughs> but also just to, to chat about astronomy and just to enjoy, you know, looking at the night sky and, and taking all these wonderful pictures. So thank you very much indeed, yeah, Mary. It's been a real you. pleasure. Thank you. It's been my first collab and I hope we can do another <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> let's do that one. What we should do next time is be sketching at the same time yes. in our respective gardens. On Zoom. On Zoom or something like that. Yeah, that would be good. Cool. Okay. Well, should we leave we... out my swearing when I get it wrong? <laughs> <laughs> the erasing, yeah. You need to edit out yeah. the erasing bit. <laughs> good stuff. Should we call it a day there then? I yeah. think that's been really useful. Thank you so much. Bad, thank you. Cheers, Emma. Bye. Bye. I'm making your cat fall asleep. Look. Yeah. Oh, no, it's waking up now. <laughs> <laughs> my wife has a similar sort of look when I start talking about it. <laughs> Are we are recording. Brilliant. I might have it straight. That'll look like you know what you're doing. <laughs> Sorry, is that recording? No, it is now. Okay. <laughs>
I now understand why people in film studios, pay, you know what I mean, like recording, light, sound, editing are all different jobs. How many children have you got? Just well, two that I know of. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am recording on that one. <laughs> I might have to cut that bit out, but it might stay in.